Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. All right. I'm going to hijack for just a little moment because I have a parable for mothers that I want to read. And I make no promises that I won't leak while I'm reading it, so just bear with me. It's a leaky kind of day. All right. The young mother set her foot on the path of life. Is the way long, she asked. And her guide said, yes, and the way is hard. And you will be old before you reach the end of it, but the end will be better than the beginning. But the young mother was happy, and she would not believe that anything could be better than these years. So she played with her children and gathered flowers for them along the way and bathed with them in the clear streams, and the sun shone on them, and the life was good. And the young mother cried, nothing will ever be lovelier than this. Then night came, and storm, and the path was dark, and the children shook with fear and cold, and the mother drew them close and covered them with her mantle, and the children said, Mother, we are not afraid, for you are near, and no harm can come. And the mother said, This is better than the brightness of day, for I have taught my children courage. And the morning came, and there was a hill ahead, and the children climbed and grew weary, and the mother was weary, but at all times said to the children, A little patience, and we are there. So the children climbed, and when they reached the top, they said, Mother, we would not have done it without you. And the mother, when she lay down that night, looked up at the stars and said, This is a better day than the last, for my children have learned fortitude in the face of hardness. Yesterday I gave them courage. Today I have given them strength. And the next day came strange clouds which darkened the earth, clouds of war and hate and evil, and the children groped and stumbled, and the mother said, Look up. Lift your eyes to the light. And the children looked and saw above the clouds an everlasting glory. And it guided them and brought them beyond the darkness. And that night the mother said, This is the best day of all, for I have shown my children God. And the days went on, and the weeks, and the months, and the years. And the mother grew old, and she was little and bent. But her children were tall and strong and walked with courage. And when the way was hard, they helped their mother, and when the way was rough, they lifted for her, for she was light as a feather. And at last they came to a hill, and beyond they could see a shining road and golden gates flung wide. And the mother said, I have reached the end of my journey, and I know I, and now I know that the end is better than the beginning, for my children can walk alone, and their children after them. And the children said, you will always walk with us, mother, even when you have gone through the gates. And they stood and watched her as she went on alone, and the gates closed after her, and they said, We cannot see her, but she is with us still. A mother like ours is more than a memory. She's a living presence. So to all the moms, be that living presence. Sorry. <laughs> um, so again, happy Mother's Day. Um, other announcements. Thank you to Karen and Pat McCain and to Dad Kurt Eide for working on the flower beds. They look amazing this morning. Um, also, keep in mind the next Ad Council meeting is Monday, tomorrow at 7 p.m. and we'll be meeting in person at the church. And there will be a discussion about um, proposals for the new audio video equipment and a potential partnership with a Montes Montessori preschool. I'm in trouble with words. Okay, so if the band would like to come on up.
comes from Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to try these words and probably mess them up, so please don't judge me. All right. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all of his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a, had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius! Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel, angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have, have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now, send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. Some prayer requests. So, um, please pray for Jane Jackson. Again, we know she fell and broke her hip. Um, she is, I believe she's in a nursing facility now. No, she's still in the hospital. She's not back in the hospital. Oh, so she went and then came back and is back in the hospital. Okay, so back to the hospital. Um, get well cards can be sent to the church or to Jane's home address. Um, also a prayer request that included Jane as well as Glenn Hale who is also recovering from something. Um, for Aaron Dennis, who is, um, he's a cousin or a nephew, he's my aunt's son, um, who recently had surgery and is still in the hospital, but he's doing much better and is apparently out of ICU. So, go Aaron. Um, again, also um, <laughs> continuing to pray for our community, state, nation, and world with relation to COVID-19 and overwhelming number of infections and vaccination efforts to continue. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, so, so Jane was in a uh, hospital. She went to the care facility for about 24 to 36 hours and then was back at the hospital do test, and that's the last I have um, heard of her uh, from directly from her family. The other one that I wanted to share was actually a thank you note um, from Angie and Kurt and the family. Um, as, as many of you know, uh, this is their first Mother's Day without their mother physically present. I know for many of you, you have uh, experienced that. Um, there are many of us in this room that have not experienced that. And so, um, but as looking back um, at support provided to the family over the memorial and the, and the weeks and, and, and before and after, dear uh, Glenn United Methodist Church, thank you for all you did for mom and her family. Love, support, prayers, food, use of space, and anything I don't know and can't remember. All is very much appreciated. Much love and thanks, Angie, Kurt, and the rest of the clan. And continues, there are not enough words to fully express our thanks and gratitude for whatever way you chose to show your love, support, and sympathy to our family. Your support at this difficult time was very much appreciated and will always be remembered. So I want to pass along that. Um, I think with Mother's Day, it can be it can be a beautiful thing, it can be an encouraging thing, it can be a sorrowful thing, it can also be a painful thing, right? I mean, we're all human, it runs the gamut, right? This is usually the, the same kind of mini-sermon I give before Father's Day, right? There's, so, in that spirit, and with kind of that complicated um, space, I'm going to read a prayer from Hannah Carton, who was a pastor at Elston Avenue at a Methodist Church. I honestly don't know where that specific church is located, but this is a prayer she wrote for Mother's Day. So I'm going to begin with this prayer, and then we'll transition to uh, our prayer list, and then into the Lord's Prayer. Please join me in the posture. Loving God, 
pray for the moms who are struggling, to those filled with incandescent joy, to the moms who are remembering children who have died and pregnancies that miscarried, to the moms who decided other parents were the best choice for their babies, to the moms who adopted those kids and loved them fierce, to those who experienced frustration or desperation and infertility, to those who knew they never wanted kids and the way they have contributed to our shared world, to those who mothered colleagues, mentees, neighborhood kids, and anyone who needed to those remembering moms no longer with us, to those moving forward with moms who did not show love or hurt those they should have cared for. Today is a day to honor the unyielding love and care for others we call motherhood. Wherever we found it, in whatever ways we have found it, to cultivate it within ourselves. Loving God, to these words we ask, for your blessing. We ask for your presence. Be, they, be this a moment of reflection, of memories of joy, of plans together this afternoon, or whether this be a moment of sorrow or hurt. Lord, let your presence be felt. Lord, we pray for Jane and Glenn as they are continuing to recover. We, pray, we lift up Aaron in the progress that he has made. We are grateful for, for friends and family, for the medical community that supports us. So much of the last year has been dominated by the, the pandemic, and we are in this moment reminded that their love and their care, their expertise and their wisdom goes beyond a single virus. Lord, we pray for our local community, our state, our nation, and the world as we continue as and through all humanity to struggle with the effects of this pandemic. There are certainly the medical effects, the illnesses, the death, overwhelmed hospitals. There's also a recovery. There's lingering effects and effects unknown. There's the toll this has taken on our relationships, on our emotional and mental health. For those that at this time have suffered with depression, anxiety, addiction, Lord, we ask for your comfort. We ask for your guidance. We ask that we as your church be a source to reach out, to bless, to heal, to make your love and your grace known throughout this community, throughout this state, nation, and to the ends of the earth. This was your great commission. This was your call and your purpose in forming the church. And it is with that unity of purpose that we say together the words your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, for today's message, it was sort of interesting as I was driving here this morning, I turned to my wife and I said, I don't know what passage I'm preaching on. Stick with me. It's not as irresponsible as it sounds. <laughs> okay? So, like, like I mentioned before, we follow the Revised Common Lectionary, which is, you know, an ecumenical of across worldwide churches are preaching from this section of Scripture today. Right? Where that's part of, just like the Lord's Prayer, it unites us in spirit. But the official verses for today are, comes at the end of this story, and I was trying to figure out how to do a sermon that felt like I was, have you been seen a television show or a movie where, like, you come in at the end, and then someone has to explain to you everything that happened up to that point? 
so that you can have even a vague understanding of what the purpose or what comes after it, right? And so, as I was trying to figure out how to construct this story, I'm like, that's going to be confusing. And so, I switched the text to the beginning of the story, which is what God bless you for Caesarea or Caesar salad or whatever town it was that came out, right? The point is, we are not in Jerusalem, right? This is, this is still in the early days in the book of Acts, right? Quick, quick summary is Jesus was with them after the resurrection, and then in the very first chapter, he, he gives them the great commission to go and make disciples from Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, and then he ascends to heaven. And then the disciples are told to wait. And when they wait, then comes down with the tongues of fire, like tongues of fire, the, the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And they begin proclaiming the good news of Jesus in Judea, in Jerusalem. As we talked about last week, that didn't take a whole lot of time before some persecution and objections rose, right? And so there's now an environment of scattering. There's an environment of persecution. We talked last week that the Holy Spirit moved Philip. This time, in a weird twist, the Holy Spirit nudges a Roman soldier. That's where the story starts. A Roman soldier, and I love this description because we often don't think of this for non-Christians or for non-part of the disciples, but he was devout and God-fearing, gave generously to those in need, and prayed to God regularly. This is someone who didn't know the Jewish scriptures, but this is God's description of his character. And all of a sudden, he gets nudged by an angel of the Lord to go find, contact this Peter and learn about this God that he's been serving and praying to, even if he doesn't totally understand all the parts and pieces. And then after that happens, we get that part of the story set, we move over to Jerusalem and it's to where Peter is. And it's, it's meal time. Peter is fasting. He is hungry. And he goes up onto the roof of where he's staying while the meal is being prepared. And he begins to fervently pray. And the Bible describes it as he goes into a trance. And as he is in that state, he sees this vision like a sheet come down from heaven. And on it has all of these animals that by the food laws are unclean, are unfit to eat. And in, as he's witnessing this in his vision, he hears the words, get up, take, and eat. To which Peter responds, no. That's, that would be a violation. That's not how this works. And what he hears back in response is, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And so as Peter is trying to process this vision, these words, all of a sudden there's a knock on the door. And it's servants of Cornelius. They have come to get Peter to go take Peter to Cornelius. Right? And this is an era of persecution. So when the servants of Roman soldiers show up at his door, what do you think Peter's thinking? At the very least, he doesn't know what to think, right? So he comes down, he hears him said, we, an angel of the Lord talked to our master, and he asked us to come bring you to him. And with that information, Peter goes. And when he gets to Cornelius' house, Cornelius immediately invites him in and he, he has all of his family, his entire household around him and he asks Peter, tell us. An angel of the Lord told 
me to go get you. Whatever you have to say, we're here. Say it. And Peter begins to tell of Jesus and the love of God and the good news that this brings. And just, the wording is very similar, it's different, but it's similar to the wording of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came down upon them. And all of those Jews that weren't with Peter were like, that's new. Didn't know that could happen. You see, Peter understood that by entering into this Gentile's house, by sharing that space, he was actually violating the law. And now he understood his vision. It wasn't about food. It was about people. Don't call anything impure that I have made clean. Everyone is created in the image of God. Genesis tells the end of that story that after that creation, God said it was good. Do not call any one unclean or impure. I have made them clean. We know that specifically through Jesus. This is within the book of Acts and arguably within the Christian tradition and church the turning point. This is the point where this is not just people that have known and seen and experienced Jesus following Jesus. This is where the church becomes inspired by Jesus even if they have not personally experienced him or his message. It's a turning point. It welcomes in everyone. And if you look in the, in, the, in the book of Acts, what happens next is it immediately turns to the ministry of Paul and his mission to the Gentile, to the non-Jews. The entire book of Acts turns audience from messaging the good news to the Jews to messaging it for the Gentile. It's a complete switch, a complete new direction. But it started out with, right, prayer and kind of a weird vision he didn't know what to make of. And then a knock at the door. Right? This, this all seemed kind of ordinary, normal stuff. Right? But it became a very pivotal, pivotal moment in our scripture and in the history of the church. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about one of those, some of those times in my life where what seemed like an ordinary, normal thing turned into something like this is a life-changing moment. Right? Some, sometimes you can, you can tell when a life-changing moment is about to occur, right? We are in graduation season. Right? Some of our students who have been in public schools for 12, 13 years, right? They're not going to go back in September. Right? This is a clear cut, we're on to something new. Whether we want it to or not, we're on to something new, right? right? There are some natural points like that where you just kind of know. We've taught or talked about the loss of a loved one. Right? It can't be the same. It wasn't necessarily chosen, it's responded to. And it changes us. And it changes how we look at things. But there are ordinary moments that shape us deeply too. So I'm going to share the story here of my first date with my wife. So the number one thing you need to know to understand this story is I didn't know I was on my first date with my wife. <laughs> it was in college. There were four or five of us that would get together on Friday night and we would hang out and we would watch movies in the room or watch TV or something like that, right? And so we've been doing that for several months. All of a sudden, I show up, and we rotated whose room it was in. 
And so it was Angela's turn to host for the Friday night. And I was, of the group, I was the only other one that showed up. Which I thought was weird, but, you know, people work or some get sick or whatever. So, but no one told me, so I just showed up and it was just me and Angela. And we did the normal stuff. We watched a couple of movies. The one I remember is the movie Clue. Right? And for those of you that played the board game, they did turn that into a weird movie in the 1980s. And we watched that together, and we hung out, we watched a couple of movies. At the end of the night, I went back to my room. As I'm walking across campus, and this is not Ohio State's campus, this is a shorter walk, but this is, I'm walking across campus, and it occurred to me, like, that was different. That, that was not unpleasant, but weird, right? And so when I got back to my the first thing I did is I picked up the phone and I called one of my other friends who's usually there and I called her and I asked her was that a date? And she started to laugh hysterically. That was my first clue. I got it right. Right? Four, fast forward four years later at my wedding reception she decides to go up to the open microphone and make this announcement. Jason, yes that was a date. Like, I knew it! I knew it! Right? My life radically changed because three people intentionally didn't show up to something. And I was left out of the loop. And it felt weird. And now we figure out where to go from here. Right? In 23 years of marriage later, after four years of dating, we're here. My story changed the night I watched Flu. Not quite as dramatic as the sheep from heaven, but that sense of something's different. The orientation is different. Life has changed. It's, it can't be the same anymore. That's what Peter's story is about. All of a sudden, an ordinary moment became a pivotal moment. Sometimes we seek for change or our plan for the future, we try to root it in some momentous decision or some momentous act. And what I want to proclaim to you is be present for the ordinary moments. Right? We, you hear me ad nauseum talk about love God, love people, serve others. The last thing I want you to do is love God only from 10.30 to 11.15 or 11.30 whenever I get done talking. If that's the only moment of your week that you love God, my heart aches for you. Because God is with you each and every moment. God is present. God is near. God is guiding you. God is guiding the people around you and you don't even know it. That is my sincere belief. Be present. Every moment is a, is a moment to love God. I forget exactly when he, he lived, but there was a, a Catholic monk who we best remember in these days as Brother Lawrence, who wrote a book, Practicing the Presence of God. And part of his story was in the monastery, he took to heart the idea of constant prayer. Whether he was cleaning something, or whether he was just out and about. And what made him stand out is he, he took those moments as moments of prayer, not just the moments where the bell rang and they'd all meet and they do their communal prayers. Practice the presence of God. Right? Loving people, if you do that part time, you're not going to have a lot of people around you to love. 
Love everyone where you are. That's the mission of the church, is to be God's people in every moment, in every place. And that usually means to serving others. So whether it's pulling weeds, offering meals, offering a hug or words of comfort, listening, Sometimes we forget that listening is actually an act of service. Right? Love God, love people, serve others. Full time. Because you never know when you're going to have that moment like Peter. Where something pops in your head that just makes you think a little different. And there's a knock at the door that changes your life. Careful, you may get to home. You can make it to heaven. Right? That's when St. Peter will tell you, yes, it was a date. You never know. So expect to see God in every moment and in every one. And that's the good news that you take with you everywhere you go. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to, to celebrate you together. To celebrate our love and our fellowship for one another in this space. For our ability to communicate our love for each other through smiles, through laughs, through stories, through tears, through sorrow. You have placed us together. Our paths have started in different places. They may go in different directions from this moment forward, but you have placed us together here and now. Let us be a blessing. Let us receive your blessing. And let us be fully present to you and to each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We uh, forgot to make an announcement about loving God, serving, loving people, and serving others, which is our breakfast this Saturday. So Melinda reminded me that we have forgot to fill out an announcement card for that. So just to remind folks of that. Our song, uh, O Breath of Life, is from the Methodist hymnal and was written in 1920 by someone called Bessie Porter Head, which sounds like, gosh, sounds like an interesting person. I wonder what her story is. As it turns out, nobody knows. But she wrote a great hymn that was included in the hymnal, and this music was specifically written for the Methodist hymnal that came out in 1989.
wants his park back. But assuming that we can all get home safely, that we've been brought together for this moment, that we have hopefully received a moment of joy or a moment of encouragement this morning. And whether you have elaborate Mother's Day plans today or this is not a day that tends to be a celebration in your house, I pray that no matter how you spend this day, that you can find a way to appreciate these ordinary moments of life, to be still and hear God's quiet voice. Don't eat.